All right, it's 12 o'clock. Uh, thank everyone for joining. Today, um, this is uh, going to be just the Todd O'Hare show. Uh, Bridger Malum is um, unavailable to join us today, so um, I'm going to do my best to give you a recap without um, our resident expert in the government affairs world who leads this stuff so capably and so well for us. Um, so I'll just give you a quick little recap of where we are this week. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, we record the first portion of this um, uh, discussion and then we stop the recording and then open it up for questions and answers and thoughts about um, things that you may be hearing. So um, once we stop the recording, feel free to jump in with any questions that you might have. So I'll give you a quick little recap of uh, where we are this week. Um, probably the best news of uh, of the week is that our House Bill 254, which was our wrongful discharge bill, which was a priority bill that we've been working on since this summer, um, passed uh, in the Senate and is now headed to the governor's desk. And that was a big priority bill for us. Um, we went as far as we could go as we were advised by attorneys uh, without going to an at-will state. And um, given our judicial climate and our the makeup of our Montana Supreme Court, we were advised against going um, for the full, uh, full hug there, if you will, and going into an at-will state. And so we got that passed. It's headed to the governor's desk. The governor has been supportive of this effort uh, throughout the uh, throughout the legislative process, and we expect the governor to sign that. And there were some provisions in there too that took out some antiquated sort of provisions relative to the rail industry, and that's included. And so um, we're uh, thrilled to be able to uh, say that we've got that bill, a, a key priority bill for the chamber, headed to the governor's desk here, and uh, we look forward to that being signed into law. Um, the other big bill that we've got is moving along. We had a hearing yesterday on Senate Bill 251, which is our phantom damages bill as it relates to liability and tort reform. That was a big bill um, and uh, it, it had its hearing yesterday in House Business and Labor. I went in and supported that bill. And essentially what that bill does is that, you know, an injured party against a business entity can only litigate for their actual out-of-pocket medical expenses. And um, probably the best way I can describe that differently is that um, if, you're, if you receive your explanation of benefits, you've got a, a bill that'll say, here's what your charges are. And then here are the other sort of deductions that the hospital may put on there. And then here's what you actually owe. And um, a lot of times there can be a big disparity between what the top line of the bill is and what you actually owe. And so in a case of like a million dollar um, injury, if you will, your out of pocket uh, uh, expenses related to that may only be around 600,000 or $500,000 after they take off the other deductions from them. But what we were seeing in those sort of instances from a from a litigation standpoint is that uh, attorneys would go in for the plaintiff, they'd go in and they'd say, no, no, it's, it's worth a million dollars. And um, the jury and the judge would never be able to see what the plaintiff actually paid in those sort of instances. And so we wanted to eliminate that gap between what your actual out-of-pocket costs were and uh, what, what the top line of the bill said. And, and, uh, and, and that's important because in those sort of litigation matters, uh, like that, um, what it does is it drives up the cost of the settlement, it drives up the cost of litigation, you know, if you're a business and someone was suing you for the full top line of that um, medical expense bill, even though that's not what they actually paid, you'd have to bring in expert uh, experts to try to dispute that, you know, there's probably a chance that the plaintiff didn't pay that full amount. And so there's um, the intent that this will drive down some of the costs of of uh, liability insurance and certainly some impacts to businesses that may be put into that sort of a situation. So um, it's in-house business and labor. Um, we've got an amendment that we're waiting on to uh, kind of bring everybody onto the same page that originally supported the bill. We're hopeful that we'll be able to get that amendment put on and it'll come out of house business and labor sometime next week. So it was a good hearing 
and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see that bill come out of there. Um, the other big bill that we've got um, that's uh, up for another hearing is our trespasser bill, which is uh, Senate Bill 338. Uh, we have that scheduled, looks like, for uh, later next week. And essentially what that bill does is that, you know, somebody is trespassing on your property, whether it's a um, a business that you own or property you own downtown or whether you've got a ranch or a farm and that person is injured on that bill and they were trespassing, you don't owe them, you know, any sort of additional care. You sh there were not steps that you should have taken to protect them from an injury that they incurred while they were trespassing on your property. It seems like it ought to be a pretty common sense bill, um, but as you can imagine, there are those that, um, particularly in the litigation world, that uh, have been opposing that, but we're, we're set for a hearing next week in House Judiciary, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to have a, a good outcome from that bill as well. So that's a little bit of a recap on the three remaining top priority bills for the Montana Chamber of Commerce. Uh, one's headed to the governor's desk, one had a hearing, and another one we have a hearing scheduled uh, for, the, uh, for its final hearing late next week. Moving on uh, quickly to a couple of other bills of um, particular uh, note for uh, the business community. Um, I went in and opposed House Bill 378, created a mini COBRA for employers with fewer than uh, 20 employees. And essentially, uh, we, have, we, we argued that, um, that this would be uh, an unnecessary burden, particularly for those small uh, sole proprietor, mom and pop sort of businesses where the owner is doing, you know, the bookkeeping and the record keeping. And now all of a sudden, if they let someone go that was on their insurance policy, uh, health insurance policy, they have to provide them with a COBRA option and be able to provide them with documentation and then keep them on their policy uh, for um, uh, an extended period of time. And so um, we, we just felt that particularly for those small business owners, that it was just an unnecessary sort of burden. And so um, uh, I, I stood in opposition to that bill yesterday. And then on the workforce development front, um, I stood in support of House Bill 624, which is uh, sponsored by Alice Buckley out of Bozeman. And then on the Senate side, Senator Tom Walsh, which has been a great friend of the Montana Chamber and our priorities in the past, supporting that bill as well. And essentially what that bill does is it creates a task force that is going to be funded by private dollars uh, to study what the, what the hurdles and the barriers are for um, child care, particularly the, in the uh, under three category. Uh, we're hearing it, especially through this pandemic, about the challenge that work uh, from a workforce development on child care and access to child care as folks are dealing with how are they going to um, come to work, go to work, expand a business, you know, when they have uh, young children at home, young children at home. And so uh, House Bill 624 sets up this task force to kind of dive into, you know, are there things that we can do to incentivize or reduce barriers, if you will, to uh, creating more um, child care facilities in the state to um, alleviate some of the workforce development challenges. And finally, uh, this morning, I went in and testified um, at the request of the committee. Um, there's a select committee on, on House Bill 632. And uh, really what that bill is, is that it's, it's, a, it's a large uh, bill that tries to appropriate all the federal stimulus money that's coming out of the Biden stimulus package. And it's a lot of money that uh, is going to be dedicated into a lot of different areas. And that committee is trying to figure out how can they uh, appropriately allocate that money within Montana so that it does the most good for the most folks across the state. And so uh, the committee had asked me to come in and testify, particularly from that uh, retail, uh, Main Street, downtown business arena. You know, what can we do to support those businesses? And uh, largely the message that I delivered there is that those uh, smaller retail, uh, non-franchise sort of businesses have all been expressing, you know, the need that we just need to have a strong economy in place in their local communities. And once we can get the, 
communities open. And if their community is a, a vibrant and a strong community, then they feel that they can kind of support that sort of, um, that their business will be supported. So um, so we went in and talked a little bit about that. We also talked about the workforce challenge the businesses are facing now where there's uh, a segment of our population that's choosing to stay on unemployment, particularly in those low, lower um, wage earning sort of positions, entry level sort of jobs. They're choosing to stay on unemployment rather than coming back to work. And that's presenting a real problem for business owners as they try to deal with the workforce challenges. So there's a recap of, of um, this week. It was again, a very busy week. I will tell you um, that the select committee and the legislature is trying to get their arms around what to do with this giant, um, I call it the Brinks train that's rolling into Montana from the, from the federal government. And um, the, the big piece that they're wrestling with the hardest at this point is there is um, limited guidance on where they can spend that money. But the guidance that they are aware of um, essentially says that you can't use this money for direct or indirect tax relief or tax cuts in the state. And so it puts into question any bill that's moving through the legislature that uh, reduces taxes, like the entire package of bills that Governor Gianforte is moving forward. It puts those bills into question. It also puts into question all of the tax credit bills uh, for various incentives that the legislature is considering today. And so there's just this huge question mark that legislators have hanging over them. It's like, you know, we've got this federal money that's coming in and how is this going to impact, you know, these bills that have been moving through the legislative process as it relates to reducing taxes or for tax credits. And um, they're trying to sort that out. And, um, and as a result of trying to sort all of that out, the legislature has uh, stopped meeting on Saturdays to try to save some of those days so in, in the hopes that they'll be able to get some, some clarity from the Biden administration on here's where you can spend money, here's where you can't, here's the strings that may be attached to that sort of thing. And so um, as it's currently uh, sketched out now by the legislature, they're scheduled to adjourn May 11th, which again is an attempt to kind of um, try to hope that they can get some clear uh, guidance on how to be able to uh, allocate those dollars and then what it means for the various tax cut packages uh, that have been moving through the legislative process. So that's a quick uh, thumbnail sketch of, uh, of this week. And, um, um, and um, we'll go ahead and we'll open it up now. We'll stop the recording and uh, 